You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 186. It's important when going after a goal to never lose sight of the integrity of the journey. Andy Garcia. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie is going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. Today's show is also sponsored by Indie Film Hustle Pro, our private and growing community for filmmakers and screenwriters. It was created for film creatives like you to meet, network, and support each other, learn from film industry experts, and to get the answers to your burning questions and more. The journey in this business is rough. There is no guarantee to success, but your chances of reaching your goals dramatically improve when you find others who are on the same journey as you and you work together towards a common goal. That is why I put together IFH Pro. Inside, you'll get professional networking, private and safe spaces to discuss the film business, access to advanced tools and education, up-to-date education, exclusive content not available publicly, access to IFH Pro workshops, webinars, special guests, and so, so much more. If you want to check it out, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash pro. Well, guys, today on the show, we have writer-director Brian Petzos. Now, Brian is the writer-director of the new film, Big Gold Brick, starring Andy Garcia, Oscar Isaacs, Megan Fox, and Lucy Hale, just to name a few. Now, Brian and I had a very raw and open conversation about how difficult it was to get this project off the ground. When you see the trailer, well, you should go to the show notes and watch the trailer. It's an insanity. (laughs) I can't believe a film like this got made, and I'm so excited that it did. I am so glad that it exists in the world and I think you guys will really enjoy it. But we really get into the weeds about how difficult it was for them to get it going off the ground. Just because he had major talent involved doesn't mean that it got any easier getting the budget together and so many other little gems. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Brian Petzos. I'd like to welcome the show, Brian Petzos. How you doing, Brian? Really good, man. How are you? I'm great, brother. I'm great. Thank you so much for being on the show, man. I'm I'm excited to get into the weeds with you on your new film, Big Gold Brick, dude. Because like I was saying, I, I'm going to ask you in a little bit, how the hell did this get produced in today's world is fascinating to me. But before we go down that, the insanity that is Big Gold Brick, uh, what is, uh, how, first of all, how'd you get into the business, man? Sure. So I actually... Well, I went to art school and part of my education, which I sort of designed my own program was I started off kind of on the directing path in film. Um, And I was, I grew up a film buff. Both of my parents are like huge film buffs. And so um, it was just always a thing that I really wanted to try to see if I could do and, and make stuff and was very discouraged actually after a year with that kind of focus. Um, I, I kind of have always been like an ideas person and that was so vocational that it, it sort of set me off doing other art making basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, I was sort of coerced into going to second city 
by a bunch of friends repeatedly goading me. Um, and so I ended up at the Second City doorstep one day and started studying there and absolutely loved improvising. And then I started kind of studying what improvisers would used to call straight acting. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and, and then, you know, it's funny because like our first day of, of class, I remember we all went to the bar after and pretty much everyone wanted to be on SNL. Of course. And I wanted to make movies. And that's kind of what I raised my hand and said I was there to do. And I know it's a super kind of circuitous path, but I knew that was something I always wanted to do. So then I started writing. Um, I actually got an agent as an actor in Chicago. Then I moved to New York. That agent got me a new agent in New York, was very kind to sort of set that up. And yeah. then I kind of kept getting more and more agents, um, eventually ended up um, uh, at UTA as an actor. Um, and then there was a point where I, I mean, I was writing and producing like short films and, um, there was a point where I just realized I, I had to like stop performing because I really wanted to take a crack at trying to be a fancy pants writer, director, dude. Mm -hmm. And I just mm -hmm. felt like I didn't want to be that guy who I, I, with all due respect to my friends who do everything, we're like, yeah, so I'm acting on this TV show and then I'm also trying to get this thing I'm directing doing. And then I'm, I just I just was like, I need to go like full priest style and just give over and like just see just honestly, if it if it if it takes like bleeding over, then I'm going to bleed. And so wow. that's sort of where that went. So you went full monk, full monk mode, full monk. mode. Yes. Yes. Minus the haircut. Yes. <laughs> minus the haircut. Well, so you did a lot of, you did a little bit of writing directing with Funny or Die back in the day when, when they were kind of launching and, and it, were, it was early on, right? They were only a couple years older or something like that when you were working with them, right? Yeah, that was, um, they were so kind to me. They were, you know, I did some stuff that was a little bit higher production value, but the stuff that I was personally directing was like really low fi um, and, you know, still absolutely had its own kind of voice and stuff. But but then we started, uh, I was performing and writing and producing, and we kind of made some higher production value things that they picked up for the HBO show. Mm -hmm. And they picked up two pieces of, of, of ours and sort of featured them as like movie of the week in the in in sort of inside the show and sure. gave it a like little premiere kind of moment. And that was really cool. Um, and then, yeah, and so at that, you know, that was a, a great help and definitely got some of that stuff out there. And, and uh, so I'm very thankful to them still. For that. What were some of the lessons you learned from doing all that kind of work? Because, you I mean, you were that, I mean, I, I know a bunch of guys who worked in at, at Funny or Die. And, it, you know, that's kind of like run and gun, man. Like you do everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, you know, it's it's I'm I come from a long line of like hardworking Greeks. Um, and so this kind of entrepreneurial thing has been something, it's been a constant in my life. Um, and I, for me, the only logical thing to do, even when I was acting, you know, I'm, I'm like new to New York. It's just, it's like, let's just start making stuff. And I think that served me really well, um, you know, initially as, as I do think there's a point where you need to slow down and not just make tons of stuff and really kind of try to you know, concentrate your resources and, and try to make bigger, more impactful stuff. But I think initially it served me very well to just get out and kind of gather, gather the troops and and, and make stuff. Um, so that entrepreneurial thing, I think, is a, is a is absolutely a thing. Now, you you hooked up with a couple of uh, little actors, uh, Kristen Wiig and Oscar Isaacs. Uh, back in the day, you were doing short films with them and, and, and working with them. How did you get hooked up with those guys? Well, I mean. Chris and I've known for a while. Oscar and I had the same agent. Um, we're all here in New York. New York is a very small, very big town. <laughs> um, and so you end up kind of, you know, running into people and becoming friends. And, you know, uh, both of them were involved uh, uh, with Lightning Face, the short that yeah. preceded Big Gold Brick. And you'll find a lot of the same people that were involved because I kind of developed those two projects in tandem. Mm hmm. Um, cause I was writing big gold brick and I knew it was going to have a bunch of visual effects in it. And the only sort of kind of higher production value short film that I had directed was Tiki Tacky, mm -hmm. which I shot in one day. 
by one day, I mean, I think we had eight hours of the actual set. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, um, so with Lightning Face, I knew what I could incorporate some of that visual effects stuff. Um, and I felt like that was going to really help buffer out conversations when people got this big gold brick feature script and they're reading all these crazy visual effects sequences. I was like, I can do it. Um, here's you know, here's some proof. Here's some proof. I did it. Hope. That was the hope. And it, it, it evidently it did worked out a little bit, I guess. So then you, you've been acting for, for many, many years. What from your acting experience uh, did you bring into your directing and writing? For sure. I think to start with the writing, actually, um, you know, I, I've been told that I tend to shed light on even smaller characters or at least give smaller characters um, a moment here or there, which is something that I really appreciate, especially as an actor, because I, I do try to really think about creating a moment for everyone. Mm -hmm. But process wise, uh, you know, improvising is has really informed my process as a writer. So just me alone, I'm I'm kind of improvising a ton when I'm when I'm writing. So that means me sort of going through and playing multiple parts in a scene, probably talking to myself, probably pacing around my apartment. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's 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 a lot of that. Yeah, I know it seems kind of crazy. Um, so there's that whole side which is which is absolutely a thing. The the irony is when it goes turns to time to be on set and shoot stuff. I actually don't do a ton of improvising. Um, I, I, I probably am trying to come out of the Hitchcockian school of let's like come with a plan and try to stick to it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that I don't like, I will absolutely let takes go places for sure. But I just, I really need to know that what mechanically worked for me on the page, like at least we get that. Um, and I also don't think of improv as like, I need my actors to try to be really smart writers while they're acting. You know, that's let's have them just be really good actors and, and hopefully trust the text. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's sort of, you know, I, I also think you can improvise in space and it doesn't have to be saying crafty stuff. I think you can think about performing um, in, in an improvisational way that doesn't include necessarily having to create dialogue. I think that type of thinking I really hope I can foster. But I really work with everyone differently. I feel like everyone has their own kind of needs. Hopefully my past as an actor, even though I never reached any real heights, um, I had a fair amount of experience in different venues. Hopefully there's a commonality there and people can feel comfortable. And at the very least, that comfortability will allow them to explore and I can guide them the best that I can. It's really interesting from, from someone who comes from such a, a strong improv background, you are more militant, a little bit more militant to the page uh, than I would have thought because I would have thought that you'd be much more loosey-goosey on the page. But I feel that you're probably doing all the loosey-goosey stuff in the prep, in the, in, the, in the development. That's exactly what it is. Like, and, um, you know, I've, I sort of consider my, my job as being like a perpetual student of the medium. Mm-hmm perpetual student of everything really, but definitely the medium as well. And, and I've read a lot about people that I admire that have similar kind of philosophies on this. Um, I'm, it seems to me that that's going to be the way it is for me. Um, I really, I spend so much time writing a screenplay. Like I just, I just finished my next script and I've been working on it for several years, you know, a fair amount of that full time. Right. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, um, you know, I write a pretty deliberate script. Uh, you know, hopefully I've done, I've, I've worked out a lot of the kinks by the time you get the PDF. <laughs> Friends, yeah, exactly. You know, and, and any other, any other profession, you walking around talking to yourself, they would commit you. But as a writer, <laughs> that completely makes all the sense of the world. I've done that myself. Like as when I'm, as I'm writing dialogue in a, in a scene or something like that, I'll be like, oh, da, 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 and, I, and I'll catch myself. I'm like, you're mad. But this is yeah. the process. This is the process. I, actually, I don't know that I was ever a big talking to myself person until I started actually acting. That's um, probably a good. That's probably a good thing, sir. I'm just saying yeah, you shouldn't no, generally talk to yourself. <laughs> no, it's like you know you're 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 on the subway and you're running lines before an audition. Sure, like your mouth's going to move a little bit. Right, and you know, then you just start to just not really give a bleep. <laughs> And, and uh, if it's if you're in the subway, really, who cares? Really, in New York I mean, subway, especially the New York subway, <laughs> like, especially after the pandemic, no one 
no one really cares. In the, let's just be honest. No one really. You're the on the on the scale of things that people are looking at in the subway. You're probably really low on the totem pole. The guy talking to himself like, with a script. God, it's just a guy talking to himself. <laughs> it's just a guy talking to himself. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. That's completely fine. <laughs> Exactly. Now I've shot a couple. Uh, I've actually, my last two features were mostly improv. So I know as a director and as an editor that it is fairly difficult to edit improv. So because it's just like every takes different. So you you're trying to find gems and moments and takes. At least when you when you have scripted stuff, it's like you get the same line twenty times. But when you don't, when you have every line's different. Every take is different. It's so difficult. Do you have any advice on how you put that together in the edit room and 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 all of that? I'm like, I usually try to get whatever's on the script once out, and then I kind of let them kind of go. Generally, yeah. that's what I do. I think you know, you've I've not done a ton that I've directed that has been largely improvisational. I've performed in stuff that has been filmed that has been largely improvisational. But I always remember hearing about Christopher Guest having to wade through like 80 hours right. of stuff to get down to two. Right. And, 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 you know, I, that sounds to me like a, a it's insanity. It's insanity. Dude. Which is one of the reasons why, you know, I probably don't want to do that. I mean, it's, it's hard enough wading through stuff that is planned quote unquote perfectly. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, it's tough again also because time truly is money and yeah. especially when you're you're trying to be conscious of a budget it's the stuff really comes into play but i would say you know to me managing a bunch of improvised material is 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 i think in the edit to me would be largely organizational right um you know finding a way to sort of you know filter through segments like story beats as fast as possible um and then kind of honing from there i mean the closest thing I can think process wise is the way I actually work as a writer is um, I catalog tons and tons and tons of notes. And my process is very editorial in weeding out or moving notes from one area to, to the other. So I think thinking about like that massive amount of material that way is probably to me the, the most logical way to do that. Now, how do you, I mean, how do you direct any advice on directing improv, improv, because you've been involved with a ton of improv in your life and, you know, some people like Mark Duplass and, and Joe Swansburg and Christopher Guest and these kind of guys who do a lot of heavy improv, like to the point where it's just an outline, a scriptment. And they're like, okay, guys, you got to get from point A to point B. However you get there is up to you. That's how I basically did my first two features. And it's I always for me as a director, I always like I'm just there to catch capture the lightning like that's sure. my job. That's just my job is to capture the lightning and make sure it doesn't go too far off the reservation and just kind of keep. But as opposed to scripted, a scripted uh, um, story, your 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 lane is very thin, whereas with improv, it's a lot wider, but there's still a lane that you got to control. For sure. For sure. I mean, I, I think, you know. Obviously, you're dealing with you want to sort of you want to be there to support a performer. Um, I think to me, good filmed impro improvisational stuff is is not good until you have performers that you can really trust to do that. Because to me, you know, it's interesting because coming out of, you know, Chicago, at least the Second City thing, when, when I was there as a student, you know, all the way in through the conservatory, it was. It was, yeah, be funny, do good improv, but do good acting, too. Right. And I know in the conservatory program, at least the way it used to be, uh, you know, it was pretty rigorous uh, audition wise. That It tends to like really scale down to less and less people as you go through that whole program there. And I think the people that end up kind of the last people standing are really good actors that are also really good at improv. And so I think that duality that's going to probably yield the best results if you're a director who's, you know, I mean, the, the level of collaboration is it's just different. It's a different kind of, you know, kind of arrangement you have with the performer, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's to me, it's really more of almost, you know, playing the role of conductor right. in a very real way. Whereas I am more a voyeur, I think, in my stuff. 
Mm-hmm. Um, sorry about the siren. Yes, you're in New York. It's completely acceptable. I, yeah, this is this is white noise. We're, we're, we're out. <laughs> so if you guys didn't know, we're not in a studio. Uh, <laughs> certainly not. Certainly not. Um, no, but I, I I really do agree with your. Uh, your analogy of a conductor, because that's what it felt like for me when I'm directing that. You're just like trying to move the different the brass over here and the the you know the the horns over here and the and the drums over here and and and, uh, and all the different kind of components to make the scene work. But they're kind of they have a guiding force, but they're on their own, and it's really exciting. And for me, directing that kind of movie, it's like you're on the edge. As a, as a creative, and there's no net, and it's super exciting to now again. You're making a half a million dollar, two million, three million dollar movie. I'm th- no, <laughs> absolutely not. But if you're making sure. kind of a lower budget film that you can do, it's super exciting as a director to play like that with the actors. Yeah, I I, I would imagine it is. I, again, I've I've got much more experience performing right and directing the stuff. But uh, I mean, I. I still love improv. I'm very grateful for the education that I have and the experience that I have. Um, and again, like I said, I, I, I don't discount it in any way. I, I just try to think about it differently. Sure. You know, for me, I will tell you, you know, with Big Gold Brick being my first feature and me also being a producer, um, I mean, every <laughs> eighth of page I'm looking at, you know, there's there's money being spent. I don't, I don't I don't cripple my own, you know, creative side of my mind thinking about that, but I am absolutely <laughs> cognizant of it and it's very real. Um, you know, the 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 dollars they are swimming away. Oh my god, it's 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 I still remember when I was shooting film back in the day and it was like when film would start turning on, you would hear it and it was just money burning, just money burning. And that's every second you're on set, money is burning. It's very valuable. Some of the most expensive time on the planet. I know. And that that's, you know, I've, I've talked about it before. It's so ironic that, you know, you spend all this time kind of, you know, in advance of actually shooting. And then you get and you have this huge, very concentrated amount of time mm-hmm. where you're working to the bone. Everyone is. And, you know, you're making yourself ill and you just try to cram it all into the sausage casing. Um, and it's super expensive. It's, a, it's, a, it's an expensive sausage. It's an expensive sausage. It certainly. Is. It's a, what, what a strange medium. It is. A, it is. A, it is a weird and wacky uh, world that we live in, uh, especially in the film industry. It's just it, and it's getting more and more interesting, which which brings me to how in God's green earth. Did you get the financing for a uh, big gold brick? And how did you get that film off the ground? Because, you know, when you see it, you're just like, I am glad that this exists in the world. I truly am. How did you get this thing off the ground, man? Well, first of all, thank you for being glad that it, that it exists. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's so funny. I know that's, um, I, I say that about a lot of movies. I'm like, I'm so glad this movie exists. Oftentimes, those are the movies that I cherish, the ones that I say that about. Um, I'm not saying, you know, you necessarily cherish Big Old Brick, but yeah. um, the, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a great place to be. Um, you know, I'm someone, as I mentioned, you know, an ex-art school dude. And, you know, I, I it sounds pretentious, but like the art side of it is like really, really important to me. The medium happens to also be entertainment. And that's something that I never want to disrespect. And I love movies that are just pure entertainment. But for me, the stuff that I really kind of worship on screen is the stuff that really takes that intersection Mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of savors it. And so that is kind of, you know, especially for this this first one, I was very deliberate in kind of you know, what I wanted this thing to sort of do when it got out there. The the thing that I just finished writing is is much bigger and probably a little more straight ahead. Not that there isn't a couple of snazzy parts here and there. Sure, sure. Uh, quote unquote snazzy. Sure. Uh, but but yeah, I, I'm you know, this one had to sort of be what it was. And, you know, I think having the two short films precede this screenplay getting out there. This is something I've talked about before where, you know, there there were certain people, both on the financing and on the talent side, who were like, 
this is just too much. <laughs> <laughs> like, wait, you want to do all of this and you've only done two shorts? Are you out of your mind? <laughs> and, yeah, absolutely. And then there were other people who were like, you know, I'm down. Like, let's go crazy. Like, let's get this done. And 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 that happened both with on the finan- the financial side and and with actors kind of coming and committing. Um, you know, Oscar was was the first person attached because you know, the whole lightning face thing, the genesis of all that. And Oscar's always just been such a huge supporter and I'm tremendously thankful. And I, I think, you know, when the script started floating around the agencies and stuff, um, uh, I was very pleasantly surprised with, you know, kind of, you know, it's like, I, I've said this, it's, you know, you, you, you've got a script out there circulating. The next thing you know, Andy Garcia is, is calling you and saying, let's talk about your crazy movie. Um, and so, you know, that's a real moment, but I hope, the, the I, that, can, you, can you stop for a second? I got I got to unpack that for a second. What's it like Andy, like Andy for Andy Garcia to call you and you have that conversation for the first time. And like, are you like, just kind of crapping yourself a bit? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You so just on, like literally just it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think because I, I've just been such an Andy Garcia fan. Oh. Like I just, his body of work is incredible. He's, he's amazing. And. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I could, I, I could talk about him for hours. Um, but when he calls your phone and you've never spoken to him, yeah, you kind of need to stop shaking. Um, and then you need to start talking about stuff. You know, you're aware of the fact that he's worked with Hal Ashby, Francis Ford Coppola, Brian De Palma, Steven Soderbergh, and then this the list in the list here <laughs> with this hat on, um, you know, so it's, it's, yeah, you, I mean, it's, and then me, yeah, like Francis for Coppola, Brian De Palma, Steven Sub, and me, yeah, <laughs> and other people as well. But it's, yes, it's of you're thinking of yourself in that in that in that context, and it's absolutely <laughs> petrifying, um, you know. So yeah, but I mean, you know, the the way this there's such a dance. If I can just talk boring producer stuff, sure. Um, there's such a dance between compiling the cast and actually closing the money. Mm-hmm. And this was a film where you know I wrote a film. What you see represented, I think, ultimately, is pretty close to the script, uh, pretty damn close to the script. There were a couple sequences that I had to I had to peel some layers off because I, I we didn't get quite where I wanted to financing wise. But I will say having having friends who, who make movies, I feel like we did OK. We did pretty good with the amount of money that we had to spend mm-hmm. um, for a first feature, especially. I'm, I'm you know, I'm very thankful for that. But, yeah, it's a process. You know, you. If you you get the cast and you get the money and you close the money and you make sure the cast is going to show up and next thing you know you're in Toronto shooting and it happened. Um, okay. Yeah, the waiting for the money to drop phase of the projects must it's just just torturous. Like any day the money the money's going to drop tomorrow, money's going to drop tomorrow, and you're like, oh god. Well, especially when you have like it's coming from disparate sources, right? And one person drops out and you're like, what? Like now I have to go get this five hundred thousand dollar chunk. And it's, you know, it's it's a thing, man. And, and I do have to say, like, there were two times I think we thought we had all the money and we didn't and it delayed our start date. And, you know, it's you know, you break down. I mean, these I'm a pretty sensitive person. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I I'm no stranger to, to letting myself feel emotion. There's yeah. just times you want to rip your hair out and, and you know, I mean, and, tears were shed. Yeah. And I, and I want, I want to make a point of this is that you had, you know, Oscar Isaacs, you know, and, and Andy Garcia, and, and you had a, a decent, a really good cast, not a decent cast, an amazing cast. And yet you're still having struggles to close, to close financing on films like that. And I want everyone listening to understand that, that they're like, oh, it's like, oh, well, you had Oscar on board, so it just must have been cake all the way. I'm like, no, that's the beginning oh, okay. of the conversation is having an Oscar or an Andy aboard. That just starts the conversation. And then that's when that guy- the beginning of the beginning of the conversation. The, exactly. And if money drops out and you got to go find 500000 well, Andy might be going on to the next Steven Soderbergh film and you might lose him. Because scheduling, that's absolutely true as well. This the schedule thing comes into play, oh. and, and you know <laughs> all of these people are represented at, at very big agencies, and you know the whole agency system is is you know I don't want to I don't want to like rain on the mystique, but it's that's a business man in a very real way. <laughs> oh yeah, and they are 
trying to make money and that's great that's that's what their job is is to to make money and if that means like carting up uh, an actor off to the next project like your SOL and that's that and you're right it's there's so many the plates that spin it's unbelievable and 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 you know I've also talked as you said like yeah Oscar's my friend Oscar's done stuff sure. for me Oscar's attached to this like <laughs> We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. The pain involved in getting this movie together, I, I, it's, it would be impossible for me to, to put into language. It is not easy. It's not easy for anyone making an indie. As you said, it doesn't matter how big the indie is. If it's an indie, and you, even if you have fancy pants actors, it's torture. I would never advise anyone to do what I do. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, hey, should I be an independent filmmaker? Absolutely not. Go get a real job. <laughs> no, look, I, I, uh, I've said before, like, film is the closest thing I have to religion. Yeah. So if you want to be religious, go be religious, man. Yeah, no, there's there's no question. And I just I always like to demystify this for people because some people just think because there's certain cast involved. You know, look, Scorsese has problems getting projects off the ground. Spielberg has problems getting projects off the ground. They're obviously at a much different level than you and I are talking about, but they still at their level, they're still having struggles. You know, the only person that probably doesn't is Nolan. He's the only person I think in Hollywood who could just basically walk in anywhere and go, I want to make a movie about Oppenheimer and I need a hundred million dollars. Who else? Yeah, gets you're talking that. About <laughs> one hand is the amount of people that can just ease into to something. It's it's always difficult, from what I gather from from as a yeah. student of other directors and just doing a fair amount of reading and hearing some stuff, you know, through through people. It's it's always difficult. I, it's probably though it's probably a little easier for Scorsese than it is. For no me. question. But the thing is, it's not Scor- Scorsese is not trying to make a twenty-five million dollar movie because he can make those movies all day. He needs a hundred million dollar movies about two monks, uh, two, two, two priests, two hundred million, two hundred million dollar movies. Exactly, hundred, two hundred million dollar movies with like two yeah. monks that are you know going off and, and are silent for most of the film. Like that's yeah. that's what he wants to do. You know, so it's a. For it's sure. relative. I mean, I mean, look at Coppola. He's like, he can't get financing with Oscar. He's going to Oscar's going to be in his movie. And he's like, screw it. I'm just going to drop one hundred twenty million dollars out of my pocket for my crazy wine money. <laughs> well, you know, I, I had heard that um, or I, I believe I read it. If I didn't read it, I heard it that for Gangs of New York, there was a point where Scorsese wanted another 20 million bucks or something. Yeah. And the studio was like, sorry, man, you're cut out. Like we've, we've given you more like one or two times. That's it. He's like, okay, cool. And he just threw 20 million of his own dollars in. <laughs> now, I'm happy to say I could throw 20 of my dollars into Big Gold Brick. <laughs> it, it did hurt. But to be able to buy coffee for my art department that day was was humbling. Wait a minute. How many coffees are you buying here? I mean, I it was like a little Starbucks. So it was like four. Four. I was going to say, there's not, I was like $20. How many coffees do you buy with 20 bows these days? <laughs> well, it was Canada, man. So I was like, oh, okay. So it's five, maybe five, maybe five. Right, right. <laughs> With the exchange, no, but I'm glad. But I'm glad we're talking about this because it really kind of demystifies it a lot for fil- for filmmakers coming up. Where they they have these delusions in their head or illusions in their head that it's a lot easier once you get to a certain level. And dude, absolutely, having Oscar attached to your project opens doors. But it's the beginning of the conversation. It's not like how much money do you want? Where do I send the check? That's not the way this business works with anybody. Really, it really is very few people who have the ability to just make things on a whim. Yeah, I mean, I think I had the advantage. I did have some money attached sure. right away. That helps. Um, yeah, it wasn't a ton, but it was it was a it was a little chunk of the budget that was sort of pledged by, you know, someone who's of a fair amount of net worth. And that that also I think helps uh, you know, even the agents here that at least oh, yeah. this isn't like a total fantasy and <laughs> and especially when they know they know some of the financiers and you know, it's it's a whole sculptural game, like I said, of just kind of the money in the cast and you're kind of piling it all together and, and, and using your hands to to work out the undulations of what the sculpture looks like. And it takes a little while. And then, you know, like I said, in retrospect, it seems like it didn't take as long, but it's it was it was a slog, man. Yeah. And and the, and that's another piece of advice. If you can have some money up front in, in, in you, nobody wants to be the first one to the party. So if you can have even a little bit of money, it makes everyone feel a little bit more comfortable that there is some money involved, so, you know, out, and specifically 
outside money because even if you threw in the first 20 percent they'll be like yeah that's nice but you know you don't have anybody at the party it's still your party <laughs> they're looking for faith right and i think i think that's that's what it is a lot of times and yeah i mean it's it's um you know i've i've there's also two different kinds of businesses in the indie world i think there are people that wish you had the next kind of horror film or the next whatever it is and uh there are other people that aren't trying to make those kind of movies and so i right. think you'll find you know as you go through these conversations the group divides pretty quickly now uh on on uh big old brick you know as directors we always have that one day if not every day, but I always look for that one day that the entire world's coming crashing down around you, uh, and you're losing your you're losing the sun. The camera broke. The actors can't get out of their trailer. Something happens. What was that day for you, and how did you overcome it? Well, we shot for thirty days. I had about forty days worth of stuff, mm -hmm. and we had to do it in thirty days. So to answer your question, that was day one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> I mean, there wasn't a day where, you know, from a, from a generator blowing up to, <laughs> as as I've, I've talked about this before, there was, there, we were on the 55th floor of a building, uh, which is Megan's uh, office, her law office. Yeah. And someone pulls a fire alarm. Elevators go out. Megan starts sprinting down 55 floors, takes her heels off and starts sprinting down 55 floors. <laughs> had to sprint back up 55 floors <sighs> not a half hour later i mean to say that you know that's a, that was that was the kind of thing that would happen about every other day um losing locations sure you know, i i need i need a, a hundred feet of clearance on a ceiling in a studio and i get 50 um you know so i have to cut like three really huge signature shots sure uh, I have to lean on the visual effects more than I intended to, which is also an expenditure, you know, after the fact. I mean, it's, it's every day, man. Like, and, and I'm the writer, the director, and I have my producing partner, my producing partner. And then we also had Canadian producing partners facilitating locally. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tough job, man. I honestly, I, I feel like just sort of that it was my first time and it was, it was just guns blazing all the time. I didn't allow myself to like feel discouraged ever. It was just, I need to have an answer. I need to have it now. You are the person that literally everyone from, you know, from whoever it is, you know, the literally the, 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 the PA out there gathering cones to Andy has a question for, for, for me and I, I have to have the answer to it. So it's no waffling. It's have the answer and just, you know, take the beating. Well, I mean, so if anyone's still listening who wants to be a filmmaker, um, you could just uh, look at the bottom line is, look, anyone who listens to my show, you know, knows how I feel about making films. I love it. It's an it's an addiction. It is a uh, I call it the beautiful illness, the beautiful sickness, uh, because it's it's a it's, we're ill. We're ill. We're ill. I mean, we're not well. This is not a normal way. But artists in general are not well. And that's what makes artists great. And and, and it makes artists so wonderful to be around because they're insane. And I say that with all the love in the world. But this is unfortunately one of the most the toughest businesses for an artist to survive in and thrive in than any other art really i mean music even is 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 tough obviously as well but music doesn't cost that much that's exactly <laughs> true i mean someone like me i get paid every two years man <laughs> I mean, it's it's that 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 alone is tough, right? You get paid every couple of years, and you're just like, well, what am I gonna do? Between it's like it's it, but you gotta love it. It's this 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 kind of love for it, and like when when someone asks, like, you know, should I go into the business? And I always say, absolutely not. If you ignore my advice, then you might have a shot. For sure. That's For that's sure. because if I say, oh yeah, come on in, it's great. I'm generally, you know, then I'm, I'm a giant film school that's trying to sell you an eighty thousand dollar degree. That by the time you're in, you'll never pay that off. <laughs> like exactly, exactly true. I I do think it does help if you think of it like a calling, correct, and not a job. Um, and and something that I've touched on before in conversations is there is a certain amount of sacrifice. I mean, it would be. <laughs> be great to be Todd Phillips and make a movie as crazy as the Joker and make a ton of money making it and have um, and have and, and play in that sandbox play with that character with that kind of re those kind of resources with that kind of caliber of talent attached 
it that's the dream obviously absolutely but you know you can't just walk into that door and be that guy <laughs> I, I mean and, and and so you know but uh i mean look those 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 scenarios are out there i mean you know but um for me it's like if you just keep your expectations low and and stay humble and you know i i don't live a very crazy lifestyle at all i live a very very simple lifestyle um and uh you know to me any additional money is appreciated but it's <laughs> I just I just keep it to where I can get the next movie going, and um, so, you know that's the only way I know. So after this movie, that the Hollywood didn't come with the truck of money and just dump it on your. <laughs> it's not no. I mean, look, I think I think people have read this new script a bit quicker than it took them to read the sure, last one. Sure, of course. But um, yeah, I mean, it's like do, you know, am I am I buying a new apartment this Saturday? I don't think so, man. <laughs> Not in New York. Not yeah. in New York. Not in New York, man. Look, no, in Idaho, in Idaho, yet yeah, possibly. For sure, man. For sure. <laughs> My God. Now, what is, is something? Is there something you wish you your what? Is there something that you wish you could tell your you could have told your younger self when you first started coming in from your experience so far in the business? Yeah, I mean, I think. <sighs> Well, you know, that's a tough one. I, I, if you, if I could have told my younger self that wasn't yet in the business, mm -hmm. I, I would say, you know, are you sure? <laughs> well, no, I would say being who I am now, I would say, you know, like it's possible to make cool stuff and survive. I was very concerned, like, especially right out of college that I was going to be literally homeless. Mm -hmm. And especially when you have not only desire to create, but it's it's a condition that you have to, which is something that I have. Um, you know, I wish someone would have came in and told me, like, don't be scared, like stick to it. Um, you know, what I was going to say in terms of my time actually working in the business in the professional realm, um, you know, I spent a handful of years out there as an actor. Yeah. Uh, you know, with with a real agent, like, uh, you know, a pretty big agent, actually. And, you know, it, it's. Even at the time, like Oscar and I had the same agent. Oscar has already worked with Ridley Scott at this point. If Oscar and I are getting the same script, I mean, Oscar is like five notches above me on the roster there. So, you know, your job for someone like me was to go and audition all the time. And I, I would actually audition quite a bit. I mean, even getting auditions is, is I've found is miraculous. So I'm out there auditioning all the time. And, and you know, it's it's. At a point when when I when I stopped acting, I, I kind of started from square one with trying to be a director. And even though I've achieved, you know, no real height yet as a director, I've already achieved more than I did as an actor, as a director. And so Good for you, I man. think this directing thing was a thing that I was gonna do when I was like super old and gray. And something always felt wrong. And I and I I got to the point where I decided to be a director and I think you really need to listen to yourself and what is going to be creatively satisfying to you. Now, where can people uh, see the film? They can see the film in theaters, on demand, and digitally, um, all at the same time, Friday, the 25th of February. My friend, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm very excited about the film coming out, and I am, uh, I'm proud of you, sir, that you got this damn thing off the ground this has been uh it is a journey and i'm so glad you shared the, the the journey warts and all with the audience and with my tribe so they understand even a little bit more how difficult the things are and what it was like five years ago is not like what it is today and what it's in five years from now it, what I, you know i don't even know where we'll be trying to get these kind of projects off the ground but that you were able to get this off the ground it is uh, a, a small miracle my friend and i i'm so glad it was it was able to be made and when you're saying films that i i appreciate that are are that were made i always think of mars attacks like i like that Tim Burton got Mars Attacks made. It's not his In best the studio system. It's not his best film by any stretch of the imagination. But that it was made, that it exists, it is amazing. And when I saw this, I'm like, 
I'm so glad that he's been able to get this off off the ground and it's out there in the world, brother. So I I I, I applaud you, man, and congratulations. And I, I hope everybody goes out and rents it, watches it in the theater, sees it on demand, wherever they get it to. So thank you, my friend. Thank you for the inspiration too. Hopefully we've scared off people who were never gonna make it and hopefully inspired people who now are like, you know what? I think I'm gonna go for it. So I appreciate you, my friend. I appreciate you and thanks so much, man. I want to thank Brian so much for coming on the show and dropping his knowledge bombs on the tribe today. Thank you so much, Brian. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, including how to watch Big Gold Brick, which is available now uh, in theaters and on VOD, head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash 186. And if you haven't already, please head over to screenwritingpodcast.com, subscribe, and leave a good review for the show. It truly helps us out a lot. And on a side note, guys, I just want to thank you all for listening and sharing this information that we have at Bulletproof Screenwriting because it has become one of, if not the biggest, screenwriting podcast on Apple and Spotify. I've been seeing the numbers, and it is so humbling that the show has grown so much over the last couple of years. It has grown faster than I ever expected it to. So humbly from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for all the support. Please continue to share this information. I want to help as many screenwriters and filmmakers out there as humanly possible. Thank you again so much for listening, guys. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at BulletproofScreenwriting.tv. 